Okay, so as most of you know, since I know all of you, I played in the Michigan Open a couple weeks ago, and I, I showed them something. I'm not sure what I showed them. Uh, I showed them that i uh, old and weak, but I have good fodder for the class because I'm his fodder. Okay, so in round one, I played a very instructive game because I won. I was white, and you, you saw this position today in both games. That's why I did this, so I would prepare you for today's games. Now, Gata played knight f3, ridiculous, and Carlson played c4. Now, uh, Nakamura played g6, which is the king's Indian, eventually. My opponent played e6, and now I allow the Nimzo Indian with bishop to b4, which pins the knight. Right, Liam? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But my opponent didn't play bishop to b4, which pins my knight, which is most of my games. I have a lot of Nimzo Indians. Instead, my opponent played d5, which transposes into another opening. What's this opening called, Grandmaster Ken West? If you sit closer, you can see. And try to knock over the tripod. Queen's Gambit. Queen's Gambit, right. Why did he choose this move order? Uh, normally I was, people choose this move order if they play knight after. I was thinking that, too. Yeah. yeah. Like, or if they play the Nimza. Well, some people might want to play the Benoni, and then they don't want to play the Benoni against knight c3, but I doubt that was his reason. OK, so yeah, it's strange to play this move order. Usually, you just play d5 on move one. OK, so I pinned his knight. And black has many moves in this position. He could play bishop to b4, knight b to d7, c6, h6, losing a pawn. Bishop e7 is the most common. Also, I've played c5, which is crazy talk, but it's really interesting. OK, this is the normal. Now, Liam, where did I develop my bishop? Uh, you can't move it. I can't move it, but I noticed I couldn't move it. So I played e3. Now I can move it. And I defended my pawn. So if he takes my pawn, I'll take back, which did not happen. And he castled. And I played this. OK, who knows what the most common move for black is in this position? You. Incorrect, but good answer. That would be the orthodox defense, which I faced many times. But more common is you. Incorrect. What? Incorrect. Well, this isn't a media class. No, absolutely not. Very good. Grand Master gets the right answer. What a surprise. H6, which was not played. You. Incorrect. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, after H6, Bishop H4, Black can play the Tartakower Makagandov with b6, or the Lasker with knight to e4. But my opponent uh, agreed with Spencer and played b6. Now, I can't play the anti Tartakower because he played b6. He showed me. Now, the problem with b6 is after I develop my bishop to castle, and he develops his bishop, uh, my opponent's going to take my pawn and have a nice open bishop. The normal Tyler Cower position would be this position. And in this position, one way for white to play is to take the knight and then take the pawn. It's not the only way to play, but it's pretty common. And if you're as old as I am, right, Liam? No, you're not as old as me. If you're as old as I am, you've memorized all of the games from the Karpov, Korshnoi, Karpov Kasparov matches where we saw these positions, especially when Korshnoi was white and Karpov was black. And in those games, we saw a lot of bishop takes f, like basically what I did, except this had already been thrown in, so black already had luft for his king and so forth. It's not a big difference, but I like those positions for white. So I took the knight. Why did I take the knight? Thanks for asking. Because <clears throat> If I take the pawn right away, my opponent won't take with a pawn. He'll take with a knight, trading lots of pieces, and then he'll have an open bishop. 
This bishop will have a nice open diagonal. And if you're a connoisseur of world championship chess, like Ken West, then you'll know the last game in the Lasker between Anand and Topolov, where black won with this nice bishop on the diagonal and crushing attack due to Topolov's bad play. Uh, okay, so I take the knight, and he takes the bishop. And now, he won't play knight takes on d5 because there's no knight there. It's good reason. So, so I took, and he took with a pawn. And now, the only active play for black at the center is c5. However, c5 is not recommended because it's not his move. Okay, because he just took back. But if he plays c5, he could start attacking my center, so I played b4. And I've actually had white and black in this position, but not at the same time. And when I have white and black, normally this move is thrown in already. That's slightly different. Now you can play c6 or c5. My opponent was not familiar with this opening because he sat and thought forever on every move and had no idea what to do. And he eventually played c5. One of my students said that was a bad move because I have two pawns attacking, he has one defending. That student is lower rated than me. So after pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, Liam, do you think white should play pawn takes pawn? What do you think? It's recommended by Grandmaster Ken West, so probably not. That's usually a bad sign. Now, the taking is wrong, because then after bishop takes knight check, I would struggle to draw. Struggle, but probably lose. Okay, now again, I've had this position with white and black, but with the pawn on h6. And white plays rook to b1, which does several things. My favorite thing that it does is it attacks the bishop. The second thing it does, it puts my rook on an open file. Third thing, it gets it off his diagonal where the bishop can capture my rook. Now, one of my greatest victories from a personal standpoint was against international master Leonid Bass, who you've never heard of, including you. Heard of him? Yeah, see, told you. And I was quite young, uh, I don't know, 14, and that was one of the first IMs I ever beat. And I had black in this position, again with the pawn here, and I played queen to a5, which most grandmasters don't think is very good. Most grandmasters play bishop to c6 because the bishop is attacked, so they move it away. And Ken West is furiously taking notes. Peace is attacked, move them away. And, and, and queen a5 counterattacks this piece. Okay, but my opponent played a third move, a move I was not familiar with, for obvious reasons. It's not a good move. Okay, he played queen to c7. And that, that defends his bishop, so if I take his bishop, he takes my rook. But that breaks a lot of rules that I teach. Although, I think Carlson, Nakamura, Ronian, and Komsky break every rule I teach, every move, okay? That's why they're all doing terribly. So, uh, while well, you're putting your queen on a half open file, so it could be harassed by the rook, and you're also putting your queen on a square that would be exposed to my knight to b5, which actually happens later. Okay, well I castled, because that's what I do when I play chess. I castle. And if my opponent takes my pawn, I could take back either way, but I was planning on playing knight to b5, attacking his queen. And then he would be left with this isolated pawn. Uh, my opponent played a strange move, I thought. He played rook fc8. What you, is that, well, it's rook c8, actually. Is that a good move? Yeah, he makes a battery. Okay, and then I made a good move, so they thought I was cheating with the computer because they never saw you make a good move. I play queen b3, which again does several things. It attacks the bishop on b7, it attacks the pawn on d5, and it protects my knight. And white's almost winning here because I have a lot of threats and my opponents can have a lot of weak pawns. Um, my opponent took, which is very complicated, so I made the worst move ever, which maintains a slight advantage, but I probably have a clear advantage here. And there were three logical moves, and I chose the worst. So that way the game went longer, which is good for my lecture. 
So according to the computer, the, the best move is knight takes d5. Okay, and that I guess makes sense. Okay, and then I'm attacking everything. And the second best move is knight takes d4. And the idea is if he takes my knight, I'll take his bishop, which makes sense. I played the third best move, knight to b5. And that's the safest way to get an advantage because I give him an isolated pawn with his bishop blocking, blocked by his pawn. Well, unlike a lot of the people in this class today, he saw his queen was attacked and played queen to d7. And I, I took actually with the f knight. Strange for me. Yeah, what's wrong with me? But I like my knights. Okay, my opponent played a move I didn't see, which I'm going to say a lot today, because I didn't see a lot. My opponent played knight to a6. Probably not a good move. What's that? Yeah. Ah, very good. Knight a6, right. And if you say it three times, then you can claim a draw. Although if Chris Bird was here, he would deny. Okay, now I made a good move because it turns out the move that's correct is the kind of move that I make. If it was like a forced mate with a sacrifice, then I wouldn't make it. If it was the only winning move, then I wouldn't make it. If it was a subtle move that nobody could understand, then I wouldn't make it. But this is my kind of move. What? Incorrect. Double question mark. Uh, actually, that might be double question mark. Knight c5. Yeah. I was kidding, but maybe it is a bad move. Yeah, yeah but then I you lose your knight. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there are certain kind of moves that I like. Okay, nobody else likes them. So usually when I play them, they're surprised. Okay, and those moves are retreats. You'll notice a young player in the audience, I don't know who, probably a low-rated player, suggested a move that went forward, possibly losing the game. But I like to go backwards, because then, you know, you're safe. Now, there was an acquaintance of mine in Michigan in many, many years ago, and he said, don't put your pieces in the center, they could get hurt there, <laughs> okay? And he made a lot of sense, just not on that particular statement or anything else he ever said. <laughs> okay, but, but he's right. The, the further you are, the more likely you'll be captured. Now, my opponent's next move when he played knight a6 was to play knight c5, attacking my queen, and possibly knight e4. Now, I like to notice things. For example, my opponent has isolated pawns. And my opponent doesn't have Luf for his king, neither do I. Another thing that I noticed is my opponent's queen and rook are lined up diagonally. And that's a tactical thing that I notice. So, for example, the way the queen and rooks are, knight b6 would be a very strong move, except he could play pawn takes knight. And I don't have a knight that could go to b6. I don't see why that should stop me, all those issues. But they do. Now, since I can't play knight b6 and it's protected, his queen and rooks lined up for that fork don't really matter. However, his queen and rook lined up for the skewer do matter, and or does matter. And so I played h3 is actually a very good move because I get luffed and I prepare bishop g4. But that's not a retreat. I like to retreat. That's why I speak French so often, to prepare to retreat. Exactly. You got that joke. Okay, so I played queen to d1. Okay, anybody got cheese? Oh, wait a minute. Ah, Perrier, c'est fou. Ah, I can't get it. Ah, yay. Okay, hey, where's my endorsement checks? Okay, so I played queen to d1 because now my queen and bishop make a battery, so I'm threatening bishop g4, and knight c5 doesn't attack my queen, which didn't stop him. He played knight c5. I played bishop g4, skewering his queen rook, and he resigned. Thank you for enjoying my lecture. No, he played knight to e6. That's why he played knight to c5. Okay, now white has a winning combination, and I, I played the first couple of moves, isn't that enough? 
Why should I play the actual continuation? I, I took the knight expecting him to recapture, and I was correct. <laughs> Don't you think Jacob would have played bishop takes knight? Yes. <laughs> and he would have also won, but yeah. Okay, and then knight d4, and I'm attacking e6. And I'm threatening bishop takes e6 with advantage, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, king f7 isn't a good way to defend. And uh, rook e8 doesn't work because the queen, like most of the GMs of the tournament right now, is overloaded. Okay? The queen is defending the e6 pawn and it's defending the bishop on b7. So if I captured on e6 and we kept capturing, his queen would go there and I would take his bishop. So if rook e8 doesn't work and king f7 doesn't work, what did he do to save his e6 pawn? Anyone? You. Bishop takes d4. Incorrect. Yes, yeah, correct. Bishop takes d4. Okay, getting rid of my attacking piece. Okay, now I have a combination which wins a pawn, but I have a good excuse for not playing it. Oh, I know. Yes. You didn't see it. That's correct. <laughs> and if I did see it, then I would have played it. So, and again, this is the overloaded theme, uh -huh. but usually when somebody takes, you recapture like Barney the Dinosaur, right? I take you, you take me, right? See, he agrees. So, uh, uh, don't sue me. Don't sue me. Okay, so, a uh, dinosaur can sue me, I'll beat him. Now, what I should do is make the queen move away from the pawn with the obvious move, Ken West. Rook takes b7. Rook t but I, I'm not as strong a grandmaster as grandmaster Ken West. <laughs> Okay. In fact, it, uh, if I work for several hours, otherwise the smell is different. That's why I'm not as strong. Queen takes b7, bishop takes e6 check, the king would move, I guess. Not queen f7. Bishop takes rook, he would take my bishop, and I would take his bishop, and I would be a pawn ahead, and he would have two isolated pawns. I would win fairly routinely with my brilliant technique in six hours. Okay, and then white is a pawn up, but I didn't play it because I didn't see it. I need to do more tactical puzzles or something, I don't know. This is here, okay. So, king, king, so instead I took the bishop, not with the queen, but with the pawn, so I could open up this line to his e-pawn and get tremendous pressure, which I did. Uh, he made some move, I don't know. Yeah, Ricky. <laughs> Defending his pawn, rook e1, attacking his pawn, which is already defended. Bishop a6, because the queen is defending both. So he's had enough of that. Now, what move would you make with white to enhance your pressure on e6? Okay, because you don't want your advantage to fizzle. Bam, you. You were supposed to laugh at that. What? Queen e2. Queen e2 is risky because he might play bishop takes queen. If he doesn't though, then I would take his bishop and I would win. Now to tell you a funny story, I had a student whose name I won't mention, stand back with, and he moved his queen and it was hanging to the other guy's queen. So that was not good. His opponent rated about the same, 1800, made some random move, and then my student played queen takes queen. He won a queen. Somebody was going to win a queen. <laughs> Turned out it was my student. Yeah, so he sacrificed, he was hoping, no, no, he just didn't see queen takes queen. Then after the guy moved, he's like, wait a minute, our queens are opposing each other. That's top level chess. You. Did you play rook e5 followed by e1? I did not. Oh. Why are you playing better than me? Two, one, two, rook e5. You want to go here? But I did that later. Now, I have this rook attacking the pawn. I want my other rook attacking the pawn. What's that? Rook to b3. And then if Jen Shahadi was in St. Louis, boy, she is. She would say this is a rover because my rook goes up and over. Hooray. Rook b3. And then my opponent, no, he didn't resign. He played here. Rook to e7. Solid. I played this. He, he made a move which I'm really unhappy he made because I can't reach it. Rook to e8. 
Now his rooks are really active, except they're not active. Okay, so that's terrible. And then I played a move that I was taught back in the day. So uh, if you've been following the chess tournament and you've been watching Godakomsky's unfortunate play, come on, why isn't he here? Oh, well, that's funnier if he's here. You'll notice Gada, unlike most chess players, likes to play h4, h5, h6, and vice versa. h5, h4, h3, and then he doesn't win any games because that's terrible. But when I do it, it's good, and that's why I'm teaching now, and he's somewhere in the hotel crying probably. Okay, so uh, in this position, I'm doing a good job attacking here, but he's just defending it. So I have to attack somewhere else. So I played h4. I'm going to push my h pawn, Godakomsky style, and then my king has a lift square in case he mates me. And h4 turned out to win the game for me because he played incredibly badly against it. Notice how his pawn is pinned. So e5 is not recommended, although it's often suggested in the beginner class because I would take his queen. He played queen to d6. Now, if Spencer was white, what would he play? Spencer. Correct. And now the pawn can't move. Otherwise, he would have played e5. Right. Now he played that move so bad that, ah, that, oh, I'm so mad. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, two, two Soviet uh, grandmasters who are now American. Uh, they're from the old school. It's so old, nobody knows. Uh, Alex Yermolinsky and Roman Jinjahashvili. Those are the only grandmasters I know who are mad when their opponent plays badly because they're ruining a good game of chess. Why are you playing so bad? I'm trying to play a good game of chess here. <laughs> Most people, they want their opponents to play badly so they win. Right, Liam? Yeah. yeah. You're like, ah, oh, he played badly. I'm winning. Yay. Right? And when you play badly against them, they're like, why are you playing bad? I'm trying to play a good game of chess here. So my opponent played a move in that ilk, right? He played a move that's just terrible. Right? If a car was walking around here, he would look at the move, shake his head, and walk away. Okay? But as long as he doesn't take my period, it's okay. okay. He played the worst strategical move of all time. Close. That, that would be the worst tactical move of all time. G6. There's a guy who's a bad strategical player. Yeah, call on me. G6. If it was Black's turn to move here, he should play G7. Okay, now his king is safe. So I'm trying to attack his king, and he's saying, okay, here, you can checkmate me. So you don't want to move pawns in front of your king unless you're playing me, then do it. Okay, h5, and now he's probably losing. Now, so he played another move that the crowd was suggesting, king to f7. <laughs> Terrible. Okay, now I can actually win immediately by sacrificing material, like taking and bishop h5. I'm not doing that. So I played queen to d2. I put all of my pieces on dark squares because his bishop's on a white square, so that way he won't take it. Julian, incorrect. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, check, king moves, queen here. Yeah, bishop c8 maybe. So when I play queen d2, I thought it was obvious what I wanted to do, but it wasn't obvious to my opponent. If, what's that? I wanted to play queen h6. And then I win. I thought he might stop that or prepare to stop it or something, but he ignored it. He played the super aggressive bishop c8, setting up for the next game. Right, Dirk? Exactly. So I played queen h6, and this is how old I am. I thought there was no legal way to not lose a pawn. I didn't see how you, I'm threatening this. And I said, well, if he plays king g8, this pawn's hanging. If he plays rook h8, I can take, and it's pinned. So I was like, hey, I'm winning a pawn, and I'm mating him. And then he made a move I didn't see, because I don't look at moves like this. Very crafty. King f6. King f6. Defending both pawns. Right where the king belongs. <laughs> OK. And uh, oh, this is a game that I beat uh, Magnus a few years ago. No, I'm kidding. OK. So. Uh, Normally when I have a winning position, if I recognize it's winning, like this one, I try to imagine how I will win. So for example, 
when I was playing a blindfold simultaneous against Magnus and Levon yesterday, I had to imagine how I would win. And then a po a po it came up and it said, congenital heart defect affecting both players sends them to the hospital. I win. Okay, and then I was able to win the games. Okay, and if, you, if you're one of the Simpsons writers, don't sue me. Okay, so uh, I imagined if I had a rook on the F file, that would give me the advantage due to it being checkmate. So I played rook to E3, threatening rook F3 checkmate with advantage. Now, he should move his, he, want, he needs a square for his king. He needs to move that rook that way. And then he's minus a lot. Okay, in fact, the numbers are so high, it's more for the advanced class. It's too high for people in this class. He played rook F7, which is quite bad. I checked, he played the best legal move, king E7. The only legal move. Also the only legal move. I took, he played the best legal move. Well, actually, maybe king d8's better. No, king takes. I, I played queen takes check. Now, he was worried about king f8 because I would take this. And he didn't like that position for some reason. Yeah. It's hard to avoid mate in one. Who would like to avoid mate in one? Who can do it? Yes? Queen d7. Hey, you avoided mate in one. Yeah. <laughs> better than I could do. I queen e7. Queen e7 is mate. Yeah. Okay. Rook e7 is also mate. Okay. So, so uh, he played king to f6 again, and he claimed to draw, and it, it was a, an American arbiter, so it was a close call, but he said king f6 was only played twice, so it's not a draw. No, none of that actually happened. Okay. Now, your typical gawking rabble chess player would either play queen g6 or hg6. Okay, but I am the atypical gawking rabble chess player. Okay, they pay me to lecture. Now again, I want to mate my opponent. So if this was bug house, I would put a pawn here or a bishop here, or I would ask Levon Aronian, not yes or Sarawan. Okay, because you know Levon would know the answer. And in this position, I tried to figure out how I could checkmate my opponent. And since Spencer and Joe already know the answer, Joe possibly forgetting. He's like, I didn't forget. Ridiculous. Right? They are not allowed to suggest the winning move. And it's the only winning move in the position. No, I'm kidding. Every move wins. Did I show you this? No. You, you, didn't, you didn't tell me either. You? Okay, you. Well, I, I like rook e3 and h6. Ah, good. I didn't tell you because you didn't get it right. This know. move is recommended by Houdini, and Borislav Ivanov would definitely play it. 100%. When I play it, you can prove I'm not cheating because every other move I made was wrong. This is my only Houdini move of the game. This move is in too good of shape if somebody plays it. So you want to checkmate black because then you win. So then I did that. Oh, I see. You. Rook G5. Correct. I want to play rook G6 mate moving like a rook, which a lot of my kids in chess can't play, right? Back me up. See? He's like, yeah. Okay, so, so I played rook g5, threatening rook g6 mate with advantage. My opponent resigned. If he didn't resign, he would probably take the rook, and I would check. And I want to play queen takes g6 check with his king here, not with his king here, because then he could run away, and he'd probably beat me two pawns down. Now, king f4 allows mate in one, which I would have played. King h4... I do this. It's not mate because he can give his queen away. And now I was planning on taking his rook, but computer announces mate somehow. I don't know, like bishop somewhere. I don't know. Nobody knows. Mate in three or four. Or it's even though. It's me, but I don't know how because I'm old. <laughs> yeah, it's somewhere. I would have taken this, and then I probably would win. You definitely would. Well, not definitely. I play pretty bad now. So then, th then he resigned and I won. Right? What? Who? Well, only 99. Right. Okay, so that game I liked. Uh, that game I already showed in class last week, I believe. Okay, that was a disaster. That was the worst game ever. That was even worse. I had a position... And I wanted to talk about table bases because nothing's more fun than table bases, right? 
Okay, so the way they're solving chess now is they're watching all of Grandmaster Ken West's games and they're not doing any of that. <laughs> then they solve chess. No, no, they wouldn't do that. No, because that would be mean. So they wouldn't do that. It's quicker than what they're doing now, but still, okay. So the way they solve chess is they're using table bases where they're solving chess piece by piece. How many pieces start a chess game in total? Ken West. Thirty-two. So if you had a, yeah, 16 for you and 16 for them. Yeah. So if they had a 32 piece table base, then chess would be solved and then that would be it. You, you guys would still lose all your games, but you know, solved. Okay, even when playing each other. Uh, now, a well, true story. Okay, now table bases now go to six or seven pieces. So they have a ways to go. And now I talked to the table base master also Grandmaster, one of Ross's heroes, Ken Thompson, okay, the inventor of the computer and the internet with Al Gore. Okay, yeah, he thought that was funny. Okay, so if you look up Ken Thompson on the internet, you'll notice he's smarter than you. What, you're, what he has water? No, right. He has a long entry. Yeah, also he's a pilot. Yeah, some of the pictures from Vegas, he was flying the guys around that took pictures. Okay, and I met him at Google and I have some friends at Google and in Mountain View. And I said, you know, I was talking to him about chess and table bases and such. And he said, the guys in Russia are working on the table bases. And he says, they'll have eight piece table bases done in 20 years. And that was four or five years ago. And they, they're finishing seven now, they're almost done. So we'll see if they do eight, if he's right. And then once they get to 32, we're all set. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. Now, the, the reason I'm talking about this is in this tournament, I had a table base position. Oh, I can't remember it. Oh, yeah, I was here. I had a rook here. He was in check. And his pawn can't take my rook because it's not going that way. So don't suggest that. And I had this position. Okay. And for those of you who count well, which isn't most of you, but some of you, you will, tell, you will notice that black has six legal moves. Three over here and three over here. Okay, now if you count the number of pieces, including kings. Are you shocked this includes kings? It's true. How many pieces are on the board, Liam? Uh, yeah, but in table bases, everything's a piece, including this board. No, I'm kidding, not the board. <laughs> six. So if it's six, that means I can go to the interblag, also known as the interwebs, and I can go to a website and it tells me the answer, although not during the game. Although it would work during the game, but not legally. Okay, and when I went to the internet after the game, it said three of the moves draw and three of the moves lose. So he had a 50-50 chance, but he was low rated, so it was more like zero. And then you can put any position in with six pieces or less, possibly some with seven, and it'll just tell you every legal move, if it wins, loses, draws, or all three. And my opponent chose one of the losing moves, which is good. You know why that's good? Because you win. Because then I win, exactly, exactly. Where's my cover when I need him? Okay, so my opponent, Picked his king up, and I knew which moves drew and which moves lost because, well, I didn't know that this drew because that's ridiculous, but it does draw. And he played here. The only moves that I looked at were king h4 and king f4. I didn't look at other moves. King f4 draws handily. And when the game ended, which lasted five hours and 45 minutes, he said, what did I do wrong? And I set this up and I said, this draws. And he said, how do you know? And I said, I checked the table of aces during the game. No, I didn't say that. Okay. I didn't say I didn't do that, but I didn't say I did it. Okay, so I said, yeah, this draws because I calculated it and it draws real easily. So, I mean, occasionally I don't need table bases. Like if I have a king and five queens and you have a king, I don't need a table base. I can do it. I can figure it out. Okay, so my I would have played a7. He would have played rook a1. I would have played king here. He could play h5 or he could check me. 
and then you would play h4, h3, h2, and it's a really easy draw. Now, the reason king h4 doesn't draw is because his king is blocked off and he can't just push his pawn. He has to move his king several times to get his pawn down. So this actually loses by one tempo. But I have a funny story. You know I have a funny story? Because I like stories. Because I, I, I always have a funny story. Exactly. So I played a7, and then I played king to b7. Now he should play rook to b1 check, and then the win is actually quite difficult. But instead, he played h5, accompanied by a draw offer, okay, which was declined. And showing my great analysis of rook and bishop versus rook, I promoted to a bishop. And he knew I would win with that, so he just took it. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> I made a queen, and he took my queen, and I took back. And even the most dim-witted individual with an advanced degree in hyperbolic topology would tell you this is easily winning for white. Black has to go here, and so he did. And I moved my king down the diagonal, Rady style. He played here. I continue with the Rady style here. It's a good thing I just read the New York 24 book. I really knew Rady style well here. He was actually very happy here, I could tell. He thought he was going to draw. And now he realized his intended h2 loses to everything. I would have mate in two with rook e7, d7, c7, b7, or a7. Since I can't reach a7, I would have played rook e7. He would play king g1, and I would play checkmate. Well, having seen that I would checkmate him in two moves, if he played h2, he played king h2. Once again, every move wins except rook g2, which wins for black. But I played rook h7, and he resigned. Hooray, and the table base says I'm winning here. The true story, yeah. It says white wins. And table bases are good for several reasons. You may have a king and pawn ending, or some other kind of ending, and you don't know if you are winning, losing, or drawing, and your stupid computer says like plus 1.3 for like 20 moves in a row, so that, I don't know, right? And then it says like plus 0.8, and you're like, ah, I don't know. But if you go to the table base, it just says like mate in 73, or it says draw. Like it doesn't, it, doesn't give you, it doesn't give you any of that nonsense. It just tells you the answer. And I've had to go to the table base occasionally. In 1994, I played in my first US championship in what city? You. You're my son, you have to know. My birthday was last week. What? <laughs> what when did I, what, my first US championship, where was it? 94. Come on, you were three. No, anybody know where the 90, where's Yasser? He was playing there. The correct answer is somewhere in Florida. Now, if you all know the cheater, oh, wait a minute, I actually could get sued if I said this. Well, I'll do it anyway. So as you know, the cheater, well, what's her name? The Nyad, the woman who claims she swam, but she's obviously lying. Diana Nyad, is that who I'm talking about? Yeah, she, she swam 110 miles and she's 64 years old in 53 hours without touching anything. That's what happened. And she went from 1.5 miles an hour to 3.9 miles an hour, uh, 70 miles into the swim. That also happened. There was no cheating for many miles. There, there was no cheating involved. See, I can't get sued. There was no cheating. It was perfectly legitimate. Okay, anyway. And Key West, Florida. Uh, I played. Three-time U.S. champion, Nick DeFermian. Anybody heard of Nick DeFermian? And I, I was losing the whole game, as was my style at the time. And I got to a rook and bishop ending down two pawns. Instead of resigning, I traded all the pawns and sacked my bishop for the other pawns. Now, I have a funny hot tub story, which actually Liam can hear. Can you believe that? It's true. I was in the hot tub with, you know, in Key West, and... Uh, Boris Crybaby Kreiman said to me, do you know Rook and Bishop versus Rook? And I said, no. And he said, Rah! he's a funny speaking voice. And he said, you're a professional player. You I said, I've never had Rook and Bishop versus Rook. If I have it, it'll cost me half a point in my life or it won't, right? And he was like, Rah! okay, the very next day, I had Rook against Rook and Bishop for the first time in my life. 
And I was like, no. And my opponent's like, quiet. So I had a rook against rook and bishop. I ended up drawing. Otherwise, I never would hear the end of it. And many, 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 many years later, I went to the table bases, because you can put the position in. And it turned out I played perfectly. I was always drawing. I showed that guy. The following week, I flew to Chicago. And boy, are my arms tired. And I played international master Josh Mannion. Not to be confused with professional potser Tom Mannion. Right, Spence? Thank you. And I had Rook and Bishop versus Rook. Again. Because I had the Rook and Bishop. And I won. And I won. And that was the only two times I ever had it in my life, one week apart. And that was 20 years ago. 19 years ago. I've never had it since. What's that? In Blitz, yeah. In Blitz games. Ridiculous. Okay, so table bases can tell you when you have rook and bishop versus rook, or rook and knight versus rook, or rook and pawn versus rook, or some king and pawn end games, who's winning and why and what the best moves are, and you could check it on the internet. Some of you are doing that right now. And someday, when I'm long gone, you'll be able to check seven, eight, nine, ten piece table bases, and you'll see more complicated positions. And since table bases have been invented, They've changed their mind about some men games, like queen versus two knights, queen versus bishop and knight, and queen versus two bishops. These endings are winning about 95% of the time. And before that, books said they were draws. But the computer's like, now you win. And there's some crazy end game. I think it's rook and bishop versus two knights, where you win in like 180 moves or something. There's some crazy, you know, the computer plays perfect for both sides. Uh, if you ever want to test your acumen at queen versus rook, play it against the table based computer and see how you do. Not, not good. Not in too good of shape. Yeah. And my brother taught me how to do it, but I forgot. So now I can't do it anymore. But I used to be able to do it. The world's leading authority on queen versus rook is which grandmaster? Boris Gelfand. Boris Gelfand, who lectured this chess club two years ago. So I hope he told you that. You saw that lecture. That's all he talked about. No, he didn't. I ain't talking about that at all. Right. Uh, but table bases are interesting because we learn a lot about rook and pawn endings. My favorite is this one. Now, you all know the Philidor position. No, I'm kidding. None of you want anything. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I teased you. So the Philidor position, assuming black is going this way, this is the typical drawing position. White does nothing, and eventually black doesn't want to make an illegal move, so he plays here. So he can play this and win. And then white moves his rook down and starts giving checks, and it's a draw. Well, sometimes you can't achieve the Philidor position, so you have other choices to make. So you have a position like this, let us say. And you got to have your king skedaddle, you know, move, so you don't get mated. And then sometimes it's a win, sometimes it's a draw. And, well, Magnus Carlsen, for example, had one of these drawn positions, and he's well known to mess up these drawn positions and, and lose. Uh, but he had one a few years ago, and he lost, and it was a draw. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up these positions and put them on the table base, and I'll know how to draw them. It'll show me the drawing technique. But that's incorrect, because a lot of things draw, and they're just sort of random. It's like everything's a draw. So it makes moves that draw that sort of make it harder to draw, but not harder for the table base, which sees every legal move. So it doesn't say this is the only way to draw, and this is the only that explains it. It just says, yeah, these moves all draw. Then when I make them, it's like, yeah, all these moves draw. And I'm like, ah, oh, I know there's no pattern. I don't know what to do. So I don't know whether I should go here or whether I should go here, although I do know. But once I do make the right move, I still won't know what to do. I think this is the right move, yeah. Right, Spence? Yeah, there you go. And then, you know, I'll still lose this even though it's a draw. Yeah. yeah.